welcome to uh, lesson 18 of um, CE 5361, Surface Water Hydrology. And today we're going to go through uh, some of the approach to the channel routing uh, portion in general and, and in HEC HMS specifically. So in general, channel routing, this is not the appropriate background picture, but it's what was there. If we move far upstream in this reservoir, at some point it doesn't look like a reservoir anymore, it looks like a stream channel. And the same routing techniques we've already applied can be applied to a stream channel. Now whether that's theoretically sound um, largely depends on time scale and the modeling need. If you can't justify channel routing in a hydrologic sense, uh, at that point you are advised that you'll have to switch to a full hydraulic model. One example being SWAM, another one being HEC RAS, the River Analysis System. And I think this will look better if I actually bring up the, I think it's this one. I'm going to just do it locally on my machine, which should produce a, a better, there we go, full screen. Let me push everybody off to the side a little bit since we are recording. Let me verify the recorder is on, actually. It is? Okay, excellent. So, um, let's begin. Um, we're going to apply our level routing, routing methodology, but instead of a reservoir, we'll just apply it to a stream reach. And then we will discuss musking gum routing, which is in my interpretation, it's essentially a hydraulic model. Um, and it's uh, one of the more reliable parts of the uh, HEC HMS software. Uh, if you want to do some background reading, uh, musking gum routing backgrounds on page 257 to 260 of Chow, Made, Mitten, Maze. And an example applied to a stream reach is on pages 302 through 304. Uh, we'll we might briefly look at those, but we don't follow them exactly. Um, technology has changed since the 1980s when uh, Chow Made Mitten Maze was uh, first written. And there is not a lot of benefit to doing these the 1980s way. They're currently built into modern software, so you might as well take advantage of that. So as before, routing simulates the movement of a discharge signal downstream, and we're still in hydrologic routing, and we're now looking at, um, we're going to look at modified poles routing as applied to a stream element, and then Muskingum Kunj. Quick review, level pole routing, we start with two things, um, the storage equation for the reach element, or the river element in this case, and a storage outflow relationship that relates discharge from the element to some function of current storage. Dr. Cleveland? Yes? I can't see anything on, on the screen. Okay. Let's see what I have going wrong now. <laughs> Any better? I can see it now. That was it. Okay, my bad. No, it wasn't you. I'm glad you interrupted me quickly enough. Um, so the, the, I'll just quickly go back through the slides that were showing up as blank. We had the cover slide with a pretty picture, um, an explanation of uh, where we're headed through today. This is a repeat of the same slide from the last two meetings. Um, in, Modern teaching theory, if you say stuff over and over again, it becomes the truth. And if you're really good at it, you can get your own TV show. Um, this is the closest to my own TV show I'll ever get. Uh, and we're going to look today at modified pools applied to a stream. And then uh, we'll look at uh, the Muskingum Kunj method. Quick review. In... Uh, the level pool or poles routing, we have the st storage equation 
for the routing element, and we have the discharge storage or the storage outflow relationship for the element. Those are two separate but interactive equations. We usually change the names to confuse our clients, and uh, this is the equation as we had it earlier in the course. Oh, I got a uh, visitor. Let me go ahead and figure out how to add them. There we go. What did I just delete? It's really weird. Okay, welcome. Um, and uh, uh, for the recent joiner, um, you haven't uh, missed very much of the video. Uh, we're just reviewing level pool routing, but we're going to apply it to a stream element instead of a reservoir. And then we go through the uh, outbreak manipulations as before. And uh, now we're going to look at uh, how to apply this to a reservoir element. So in the diagram, uh, we have some portion of a channel. And the usual terminology is that's called a reach. It probably got that name because it's a real reach of imagination to believe that this is at all appropriate. No, just kidding. Um, I don't know the source of the word reach. Maybe it's because it reaches from point A to point B. And inside the uh, channel, we have um, here's a portion at some moment in time uh, that represents the water surface. I'm trying to stay in this dashed rectangle. And as uh, water flows in and water flows out. If the inflow and the outflow are the same magnitude, so the same number, and the channel already has water in it, then we would expect the water surface elevation to, to be flat, uh, as it's uh, depicted here. Flat in the sense that we could approximate it with level, with a level pool. I mean, as long as the reach wasn't so long that the drop in elevation along the channel was uh, was too much. Okay, so if they're the same and the channel's full, anywhere in the channel, we would uh, consider the depth discharge relationship with some kind of Manning's equation. Um, as the inflow increases relative to the outflow, so at the upstream end, if there's a change in inflow, water takes time to get to the outflow. And so in level pool type routing, um, that excess inflow gets stored. And then um, as it continues, that um, portion of storage gets pushed downstream and now the storage elements here, and so on. And that entire section is called uh, wedge storage, and whereas the level pool is called prism storage. For the time being, ignore the K, the X's, and the Q's. Uh, the drawing is actually from the musking gum method, but it's a good enough drawing to explain um, level pool routing. So in true level pool routing, the X term is zero. There is no wedge storage in level pool. So as the inflow increases, the entire water surface moves up and down to reflect the storage change. And in, if you were to imagine a one acre detention pond, apply a lake maybe around where you live, um, that's probably not a bad uh, model. Uh, as water comes in, the water surface of the playa just increases uniformly over the entire area. But now if we stretch that thing out into a river, it's absurd to think that an input at the upstream end is somehow going to magically uniformly raise the entire water surface elevation along its entire length. And that's where we have to look at some uh, different techniques. Um, so the storage in the reach can be estimated as the product of the average cross-section uh, for a given discharge rate in the, in, the, in the reach length. 
So if we know the uh, uh, discharge at some uh, moment in time, and we know the outflow cross-section and the inflow cross-section, or we could just state that it's a normal depth throughout the uh, region and depth for geometry that way, we could take the upstream area, the downstream area, compute their average, and then declare the storage in the reach is simply that average flow area multiplied by the reach length. So estimating channel storage um, from cross-sectional areas for a given discharge is straightforward. I almost said easy. It's not easy. It's straightforward. And depending on the, uh, if we, we could program that up to handle most practical geometries and these computations become to us, the human being, somewhat trivial. <clears throat> Next, we use a rating equation at each cross-section to determine the cross-sectional areas. <coughs> so returning to our same picture, I'm going to look at the downstream end. We look at that cross-sectional area and we have Q is equal to some function of the area. And if area is equal to some function of flow depth, and so I use I use H for the depth. Then for any given flow depth, we can compute we can compute area, and then that area goes into the area discharge function. That's called a rating or a rating curve. And um, it can be something as simple as this, where we have depth. In discharge, since depth is directly proportional to area, so this axis could be essentially an area axis. Might it's might look something like that. So for any given area, we can determine what the discharge is. And even though I'm drawing this here as a curve, uh, that that curve can be stored as a function. This f of a. If the, if the flow is argued to be normal in the channel, which would make sense in most instances of level pool routing applied to a stream reach, for example, this would be our rating equation. So on the screen is Manning's equation for U.S. customary units, and <clears throat> we would apply... Um, our geometry of the channel to get values for area and hydraulic radius and in those we would end up with area is some function usually of flow depth that's usually the most that's what we measure it might be stage so it's areas a function of stage and the hydraulic radius is also a function of stage. And usually that uh, function of stage is, let's see, the radius is the area over the wetted perimeter. So we often don't even attempt to get hydraulic radius as a function. We'll get wetted perimeter as a function of depth. And these are both functions of depth. Okay, writing with a mouse, um, I actually can write a lot more legibly than this, but I don't have a pen, I have a mouse. So that's um, one example of a rating equation. Or we could, if it's actually a rated section, we could use the observed ratings. Um, if it's engineered cross-sections, um, there's, there's 
only a handful of geometries that are usually used, uh, rectangles, triangles, trapezoids, and the mighty circle. Natural cross-sections are treated in essentially the same fashion, except that we have to apply numerical integration methods for the depth area, uh, top width area, and perimeter area computations. And so, so by that, for a natural cross-section, we would represent the cross-section as a collection of uh, elevations along a survey station line. So there's my uh, cross section and then so that's how we would uh, handle a natural cross section. We represent it in some program like that and for a given depth we uh, would simply interpolate between this, this point and this point, that location, interpolate between this point and this point, that location, and then approximate the area um, with a numerical integration of these trapezoids. And it's actually harder to draw than it is to explain. So all, all, all it is, is it's taking this polygon that's cut at that level set and computing that area. And then the wetted perimeter is simply the length along this path. Also reasonably straightforward to compute um, if we have to. And, then, and so most of... Uh, practical computer programs perform those operations on our behalf because it, there's no need to have the analyst or the designer make those calculations independently and then supply it to a program. Unless you could, there's no practical value of that. Um, so we'll stipulate that natural cross sections or engineered cross sections for the most part are representable in a structure like that. For example, so we'll let's look at a few. Uh, the rectangular channels, uh, which is clearly an engineered cross-section, but sometimes um, that's not a bad approximation for a natural channel. The depth area, depth top width, and depth perimeter functions are written right here on the slide. Uh, in this case, depth is the variable y. And the area, the blue area here, is B, the um, bottom width of the channel, times the depth. The top width is the constant function B. And the perimeter is that length B plus this vertical Y plus that vertical Y for a depth perimeter function of B plus 2Y. Trapezoidal channel uh, takes that same model and... Um, allows the sidewalls to have slope. In this particular case, the slope is the same on each sidewall. The depth area, depth top width, and depth perimeter functions are all listed here. So the, the depth area, if you examine it somewhat, that is the, triangle, the rectangular portion right here. And the my squared portion is the sum of the area of that triangle and that triangle. The depth top width is that length B plus that length along the slope plus that length along the slope for the B plus 2MY. And the depth perimeter just considers the length of that hypotenuse. Triangular channels are special cases of trapezoids, so if you have a functional representation for a trapezoidal channel, uh, to get a symmetric triangle, just set the value B equal to 0. And if you have a, what I call a J-shape, you can set B equal to 0. And 
use the uh, area, top width and perimeter equations and cut them in half as needed. Circular channels, uh, which are uncommon in natural surface water hydrology, but play a role when we start talking about engineered drainage structures. Also, a natural channel might well be approximated by a half circle. Uh, so here are the uh, equations for cir circular channel with a free surface. So this upper surface here hasn't touched the top of the circle. Um, the diameter is D. The flow depth, again, is measured from the thow wave to the water surface. And every uh, all the calculations are based on this angle, which is formed from the ray that extends from the origin of the circle to the um, to the water solid uh, interface. So there's that ray there and that ray there. We know something about each of these rays. We know that their length is d over 2. So we apply uh, trigonometric relationships and we can come up with a uh, depth area function, depth top width function, and a depth perimeter function. And this was, in fact, the geometry that was used in yesterday's uh, discussion for estimating the discharge from the pipe when we were building this storage discharge function for the uh, one-acre detention pond. And then once the pipe goes under pressure, we just switch to the orifice equation. Irregular cross-sections, we go through the following process. So here's um, the three variables of importance that are uh, depicted. We have the top width, wetted perimeter, and the blue represents the uh, area, all as a function of the flow depth y. Um, for, for depth area, the geometry is broken up into uh, sub-panels. So for example, Area 1 represents this portion. Area 2 is that portion. Area 3 is that portion. Area 4 is that portion. And then as the depth increases, at the first depth we just have area 1. At the second depth, area 1 plus area 2, area 1 plus area 2 plus area 3, and so forth. And this produces a depth area relationship that can be stored in a table and by table lookup and interpolating between numbers in a table we can approximate the flow area for any depth in an irregular cross section. The same exercise is done with top width and in the uh, Top width case, we get the top width at that location, that location, that location, that location, and so on. And um, this part's incorrect. So when we go to the first depth, we have top width 1, the next depth is top width 2, the next depth is top width 3, and so on. So T1, that one is T2. D3, I'm going to go ahead and nuke that, at least in the video. And that again gets tabulated, a depth uh, top width uh, tabulation. And I'm, I'm drawing this here as if we were making these by hand. So we'd be using planimeter, planimeters and rulers to build the graphic on the left of the uh, image. But in a computer, we literally only enter station and elevation information of the polygon that represents this shape. Um, same thing's happening, but the um, various values are done computationally rather than measuring it with a ruler. Lastly, the depth perimeter 
which is um, a little harder to draw, is um, we have the perimeter at the first depth, which is P1, green is P2, blue is P3, and so we make those measurements at different depths. And again, that is wrong. That should be P1, P2, P3. And we don't have to do this for regular cross sections. It can be done for engineered cross sections just as easily. And, and that would be, that is what is implemented in professional programs. Um, next, we need to uh, consider flow direction. And the convention is to express the station along a cross section with respect to whatever looking downstream is. So if you um, consider the left bank, the left bank of any stream is always the left side as you are looking in the downstream direction. The right bank um, is the right side as you're looking in the downstream direction. And this convention is used worldwide. Um, you know, there's some places in the world where uh, geographically, the left bank is in the wrong place, but it is still the left bank as far as the stream is concerned. And um, if you see the terminology river left or left bank, uh, that's what they mean. And by convention, uh, most survey, survey cross-section data are reported from left to right. If not, there is a clear indication in the record that um, that, 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 that that's not true. So you can safely assume that when um, they talk about uh, river flow and the left side of the river, that it follows this convention. Uh, in tidal regions, that's a little tricky because uh, if it's tidally influenced portion of a river, left and right are going to change depending on whether it's a uh, ebb or flood tide. And in those cases, the convention is that downstream is the direction flowing away from land to the ocean. And that gives you a unequivocal choice of left and right. And uh, don't dismiss that as silly as it sounds. There's a lot of uh, uh, streams in throughout the world, uh, Texas has plenty, that are tidally influenced. A um, good example is Buffalo Bayou, downtown Houston, is um, about 60 miles from the Gulf of Mexico as the uh, F-16 flies. It's about a minute. Um, and the tidal behavior in the Gulf of Mexico and consequently in Galveston Bay and then up the Houston Ship Channel into Buffalo Bayou and, and into downtown Houston, uh, that, that portion of the bayou is tidally influenced. The flow rates change during the course of the day regardless of what the inflows are because of the uh, tide changes at the downstream end out there in the Gulf of Mexico. That's 60 miles, and then there's other instances of that. So there's no doubt that the uh, Mississippi River um, and New Orleans is tidally influenced, and that probably moves quite far up the Mississippi. Um, so tidal influence is, is not a novelty. It's a real thing, and in some cases, fairly important. So now we proceed with channel routing. Uh, we should have, there should be sufficient background. In channel routing, what we're doing is we're taking a known inflow hydrograph and an initial storage condition and propagating it forward in time to estimate what the outflow hydrograph is going to look like. As an example, yesterday, the example, we used a technique called lag routing. And in lag routing, um, the initial storage condition is irrelevant, and 
the hydrograph is propagated forward in time to estimate an outflow hydrograph. And in the case of lag routing, the outflow hydrograph is the inflow hydrograph at the new time reference. So if it takes an hour for the hydrograph to travel the reach element, the peak flow at the inflow occurs at the outflow one hour later. That's lag routing. Um, but now we're looking at a technique that can, in some sense, deal with attenuation effects and, and the uh, time lag that's observed in, in real observations. Uh, so the, there's a time step value that has to be selected if we're doing this by hand. And that delta t value should be made so that it's smaller than the travel time in the reach at the largest likely flow. It's smaller than about one-fifth the time to peak of the inflow hydrograph. Um, I don't think that one-fifth is going to be explicitly mentioned anywhere in the literature. That's a, uh, a rule of thumb um, that's, that's based on the uh, response of a resistor capacitor inductor circuit. It takes about five con time constants of the circuit for a disturbance to be detected. And it seemed to work pretty good for hydrology. So it's kind of scary to think that hydrology and electrical engineering are interacting because water and electricity don't mix very well. Nevertheless, uh, that's some guidance. Um, HEC HMS, if we're using that particular tool, manages this issue internally. But if we're going to roll our own tool, we have to be aware of this time step choice. It's pretty important. Um, so now we're going to look at a simple channel routing example. Um, we're going to have a channel that's half a mile long, um, has a longitudinal slope of 0.09%. And for those of you at home without a calculator, that's really a very flat channel. Uh, clean sides with straight banks, no rifts or deep pools, and then somebody's gone and roughed up the concrete and comes up with a Manning's end of 0 0.03. I think that's kind of funny if you're familiar with Manning's equation. Clean sides and straight length and a Manning's end of 0 0.03 are inconsistent statements. Um, so whatever this channel is, it has some special surface treatment to get its Manning's end up. And the, the dimensions of the channel are shown here in the diagram. So it has a bottom width of six feet, and then we have a initial trapezoidal portion with a one-two side slope uh, that gains two feet in elevation. So if it's two feet in elevation and this is a um, one to two side slope, we've, um, we've gone four more feet in this direction. So this drawing is not to scale. And then there's one to six side slopes out to however far that is. And there's no, uh, horizontal, no horizontal distance indicated. So this is our, our channel, which we well, ultimately can represent as one, two, three, four, five, six points. I'll take advantage of that later. Um, here's the inflow hydrograph that's going to occur at the upstream end of this channel. Um, and the relevant part here, the time is in hours. There's one, two, three hours total. Our peak discharge is 360 cubic feet per second, and that occurs one hour into the hydrograph. And uh, this is all kind of washed out in the slide, and it's a triangular hydrograph that simply um, makes things uh, a little bit easier to manage as an example. If we're to look at the area under the hydrograph, we'll see that the <clears throat> area on the rising limb side <coughs> is smaller than the area on the trailing <coughs> limb side. Um, uh, so that um, 
has has consequence. The total area of the hydrograph is pretty easy to find because it's a triangle, as are these individual areas. And I'm going to just eyeball this. Probably the centroid is somewhere there. So that vertical red line represents a moment in time where half the total volume has already entered and there's half remaining to go. Actually, that vertical line may be a little bit more to the left, but I believe you get the idea. So here's our configuration now. We have our input hydrograph uh, depicted here at the upstream end. So there's our inflow. We have our routing element. In this case, it's that 2,500-foot um, channel. And has Manning's end of 0.03 and the geometry that we had. And then there's the output hydrograph that comes out of the channel. Um, in terms of any of our computer models, this element is essentially a black box. I guess I painted it red. We'll go ahead and make it to a black box. Black. That's a black box, and we have a time series coming in, and we'll have a time series going out. So we will um, uh, do this example as if we were going to um, put it into a computer program. And there is some work we have to do ahead of time. It's um, if we're going to do uh, level pool routing for sure. We have to build a depth storage table and a depth outflow table for our routing element, which is a 2,500 foot long channel, Manning's end of 0.03, and the uh, trapezoidal geometry that was depicted earlier. And then we have to make the input hydrograph, pretty much turn the pictures into numbers. That's not that difficult. And then build the routing table and apply the reach mass balance. So we'll go through these one at a time. To build a depth storage table, for the channel, we just simply we we would select some depths. In this case, going from zero to six feet. Once we have a depth, calculating the cross-sectional flow area from that geometry is is not um, super difficult, and so it's shown here as the area function. Calculating the wetted perimeter, a same statement holds true. Um, area divided by wetted perimeter gives us hydraulic radius. And we know the channel slope because that's given to us. And we can compute discharge based on Manning's equation, which is the column depicted right here. You'll notice that I've also computed velocities. And the reason for doing that, if we're doing this by hand, is we can use that to uh, produce an appropriate time step. So this is at six feet deep, it's stating the velocity is almost three feet a second. So any time step we use uh, needs to be one-fifth of the time that it would take to traverse the whole channel. So the cha channel is 2,500 feet long, and we're moving three feet a second. Uh, 10 seconds gets us 30 feet. 100 seconds gets us 300 feet. 1,000 seconds pretty much passes through the channel. So we need a time step that's less than one-fifth of, of 1,000 seconds. So something in the 200-second range would be the uh, upper end. And then um, once we have the area as a function of depth, the storage is simply the product of that area and the channel length. And that produces this column. 
And then we apply our usual um, level pool routing calculations to get a storage minus outflow, storage plus outflow, and in this case I've chosen a 600 second time step. And the input hydrograph, um, you simply pick a few numbers off the hydrograph and uh, read directly from the uh, chart. So some, from 0 to 60 minutes is 0 to 60 minutes is that line. So we know we know the 0, we know the uh, 60 minute right away, and then we just uh, use a point slope uh, representation of that line segment to fill these intervening ones. Then from 60 minutes to 180 minutes is that line. And <clears throat> so again we use point slope to uh, provide those intermediate values. So there's the two legs of the triangle to uh, produce our input hydrograph. Uh, then we um, can you <clears throat> and so now that we've done that um, we look at our old depth storage outflow table, which was for a prior problem, and we'll modify it. And with that modification, um, we can have our input hydrograph using a time step of 10 minutes, which is well under our um, critical time step of 720 minutes in this case. And then our time step, average inflow, this is converted into seconds, depth, and the level pool routing results. And now we can plot the results. And the uh, triangle, the Solid blue triangle is the input hydrograph, and the magenta sort of triangular looking thing is the outflow hydrograph. You'll notice we captured the lag time, and let's see, on this scale, that's at 60, that's at about, we can go, actually, we can go look at it. Our inflow lag time is our peak outflow occurs about, about 10 minutes is the uh, peak outflow. So 10 minutes converted into seconds is 600 seconds. Um, this particular computation is a little bit more elaborate. It's somewhere around 800 seconds. But um, based on the plot, it looks like about 10, 10 to 20 minutes is the lag time, which, which makes sense for a channel of that length. Um, and now we can also illustrate it in HEC HMS, which is what I will finish today's lesson with doing, assuming I can um, get everything to work right. Um, so doing it by hand, other than teaching yourself how to do it and understanding what's going on, has limited practical value, because it's pretty unlikely you'd ever do it by hand in a real case, unless nothing else is working. Uh, but that was to introduce what's going on inside of HEC HMS. So in HEC HMS, this level pool routing idea, um, the, the reach can be any routing element. 
So let me set up for online live demonstration. So I'm going to need that. And I need a working copy of Share Hydro. And let's get it big enough for everybody to see. Okay, so I will be switching between this window and the one behind it. Um, Create a new project. Um, this is going to be called uh, Channel Routing. And US Customary, hit Create. To speed everything up, I'll go ahead and create the components without thinking. We need a basin model. We need a meteorological model. And we need a control specification model. And we might need a time series for the input or a um, paired data series for the input. I don't know yet. So let's return to the example, and it looks like we have a source and a reach. So we go to our basin model, and we will create a source. And we'll create a reach. Let me kill reach number one because it came out the wrong size. Let's see. Delete. Okay. I will rename this one to reach one. Okay, that was what I should have done. Um, sometimes the graphics window doesn't respond fast enough to keep up with what us, the human beings, are doing, which is pretty rare in the world of computing. So I think that will be a sufficient model to represent our example. And it looks like we'll need time series data for our uh, inflow. The, all the uh, data in the spreadsheet is shown here. Uh, the depth discharge functions, and in our case, we want this inflow hydrograph. Copy that. Let's hope this actually works. Ten minute intervals. Failed to work. Okay, it looks like most of it's there. Go away, little poo. There we go. And now we will just use the fill feature to complete the series.
fill. Repeat first value, OK, run the graph. So that's a completed time series. Save the work. <clears throat> so here's our source. We want to connect the source downstream to reach one. And in the source, we want to provide observe flow. So now our, our source is um, validated. Next thing we would want to do is we're going to want to build the reach type. So we're going to want a storage discharge function. So storage discharge functions are paired data. Acre feet, CFS, note the units. <clears throat> and in this case, we want to put in the storage, which is that, and here it is in acre feet, and then here is the associated discharge in cubic feet per second. So let me copy that. And we'll get the discharge. Copy that. See if the graph looks right. Up to 10 acre feet, does that make sense? Yep. So that's the storage discharge function. Uh, a null meteorological model. So that essentially means we turn all this stuff to none, namely the precip. So we're good there. And in principle, we should be ready to route. And we're using, pretty sure I'm using modified pools. Store discharge function, options, nothing. I think we're set to go. Hit save. And let's now run the simulation. In that, we would have to create a compute run, and I'll just accept defaults. Simulation's ready to go. Hit the exploding raindrop, and we have errors of some kind. And we'll have to Simulation end time, 31 December, 69. That's weird. Um, I didn't have my control specifications set correctly. Let's try the correct one. 1 January 2000 to January 2000. Zero, zero. Colon zero 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 colon zero zero ten minutes. And let's see what the error is here. Flow gauge name is not set for source one. Save it. We'll try that one more time. 
Yay, that's a win. It did something. Let's take a look at the uh, output for source one, the triangle. Look at the output for the routing element and we can see the triangle is the input and the triangular looking hydrograph is the output. And we can also um, get the summary table. So the peak inflow was 360 cubic feet per second. And the peak outflow was 315 cubic feet per second. The peak inflow occurred at 50 minutes from the beginning. So I think I have a subtle data entry error. I'm, I'm lag timed by one time interval. And one hour and 20 minutes is when the peak discharge occurs. So if we look at that, 50 minutes plus 10 is an hour plus 20 more gets us to the new peak. So the lag time for this situation is 30 minutes. Um, I have enough time remaining that I am going to um, rerun this simply with a uh, lag time routing. And I'm going to use that 30 minute lag time that we just determined. So if we use lag routing, we need to tell it what the minutes is, which is 30. And rerun the model. And what we, what we see in lag routing is exactly a 30 minute lag, but the hydrograph shape, peak, time base is identical. So that's what lag routing does. And you know, if we put a ridiculous, let's put 600 minutes on it so we can actually see a change. So there's lag routing with 600 minute lag. There's no attenuation. However, if we change to our um, level pool routing, which is um, what we um, have. The drop in peak is apparent. Um, you know, lags back to 30 minutes because of the uh, uh, channel length. It's odd, I don't remember providing the length. Did not provide the length. That's interesting. Oh, that's because it has um, the storage property in it. And that concludes the example. So if the if the channel were a lot longer, let's see if I can mess with the table and break something. If the channel were 10 times longer, then our storage discharge relationship would simply have this um, portion of the table multiplied by 10. Choose OK. So 10 times longer should take that 30 minutes to 300 minutes, about five hours. If I do that, hopefully I haven't broken anything. Rerun the model. And well, but I expected a bigger lag, but you can see the effect of making the channel longer. It, it doesn't shift as far to the right as you would expect based on lag routing. Um, in any event, um, in cases where you can use um, storage routing, it makes sense because it's picking up the attenuation as well as the uh, travel time that's required. Uh, that concludes the lesson for today. And like I said at the beginning, I will continue repairing the server. And when I have it working again, the way it's supposed to so that you all can access content, then I'm going to, um, I'll put up a homework assignment the homework assignment is, is literally going to be um, doing exercises like what I've demonstrated in HEC HMS. And I apologize that I haven't gotten that out sooner. I'm aware of the uh, almost one week delay, but um, it doesn't do any good if the uh, server doesn't work and you have no resources to refer to. 
So, oh, that doesn't complete today. Well, 10 minutes or less. The next um, technique is called muskingum routing, and it's a storage routing technique that is used to translate and attenuate hydrographs in natural and engineered channels. And it avoids an additional complexity of doing full hydraulic routing. And this method is appropriate for stream reaches that have approximately constant geometric properties. They don't have to be absolutely constant. But a stream that doesn't change width very much over a, uh, a length portion would be appropriate. At the upstream end, the inflow and the storage model are assumed to be related by these two power law models. So inflow is some power law function of depth, and storage at the inflow end is some power law model of depth. At the downstream end, um, the results are also assumed to be related uh, by power law models, although the parameters of the model might change. And then next, the depths at each end are rewritten in terms of the power law constants and the inflows. And so the inflow uh, storage is B times inflow raised to the M over N power divided by A to the M over N power. And the outflow is B times the outflow to the M over N power divided by A to the M over N power. Then we conjecture that the storage within the reach is a weighted combination of the section storage at each end, essentially wedge storage plus pool storage. The weight W ranges between zero and one half. If W is set to zero, the storage in the reach is entirely explained at the outlet end, which is level pool routing. If storage is a half, the storage is the arithmetic mean of storage at each end. So, it's a way of quantifying the two different end areas for the reach element. And uh, generally, variables from the power law models are substituted. Um, so uh, k is equal to b over a to the m over n power. And z is the ratio of the exponents. And the routing model is expressed as follows. Storage is equal to a constant k multiplied by the quantity w times inflow raised to the z power plus 1 minus w times outflow raised to the z power. For convenience, z is usually taken to be 1 and results in the usual form of the musking gum equation, which is shown here at the bottom of the slide. Storage s is, is k times the quantity um, w times i plus 1 minus w times o. For most natural channels, that value W ranges between a tenth and three tenths and are usually determined by calibration studies. The muskingum kunge method further refines the model <clears throat> to account for or to relate the values of the weights to channel geometry, slope, and resistance features. And at this level of abstraction, um, the model is nearly a hydraulic model. And, that's, and that one that is nearly is kinematic wave. Um, so we're going to use the same example, and I'll go through it quite quickly. We have the uh, worksheet, the uh, HMS model already built, so it should be a simple matter, matter to change the routing method and illustrate it. Um, so one way of estimating W and K is listed here. We estimate the celerity based on bank full discharge, or the... Uh, deepest discharge value, and we estimate k as the ratio of the reach length to that celerity. It's going to be in units of time. It's essentially a reach travel time. We estimate the weight as one half the quantity, one minus the uh, specific discharge, divided by the slope, divided by the celerity, divided by the channel length. And if we use the same example condition, so it's that same um, that same small channel, uh, we come up with the uh, following uh, values. Uh, we have a value for K of 764, or 0.21 hours, and a value for W of 
0.269. And we can insert those directly into our model, which already exists. So we will go back to our reach element, go from poles to Not the one I wanted. I guess true musking gum. That's that's better. So I want to supply the musking gum K in hours, and we get that from this analysis here. So 0.21 hours, and a musking gum X is 0.29. It's almost 30. Sub reaches, I think we leave that as one. And we'll rerun our model. Good, it didn't protest. I like that. And now we see the musking gum model applied to the same thing. Pretty close to um, uh, what we saw before. If we change the x to a zero, that is the same as level pool routing, as I recall. And so we should have a very similar looking outflow hydrograph. Pretty close. It's um, less exact than I would have expected. If we change that to a half, well, we are almost uh, doing lag routing. 0.25 uh, is pretty close to what we uh, calculated for this case. So that's that's another uh, routing technique. So you just watch me do that live really fast. Um, if we were to change the... the uh, the weight to zero and set the K to 20 minutes and increase the number of reaches, um, we get a more of a level pool type model. And lag routing where we um, change the X to a half. So this term, the subreaches term, is um, how it's going to break up the calculation. So it would take our reach and make it into smaller reaches. There's a certain level of smoothing that occurs because of that. And I think that's supposed to be point twenty nine. So that was our initial case. If we go to zero, that should be level pool routing. And if we go to a half, Yeah, almost lag routing. Okay, so let me return to here. Um, the last one is Musking Kunj, which we will pick up on Monday. Uh, it, it won't take very long, and uh, that will be a good segue into dynamic routing using a different computer program, where we actually consider the channel hydraulics. Um, I want to thank you for your patience this week in tolerating the um, what's going on? Tolerating my inability to operate my own computer. In tolerating uh, the the computer issues, and we'll get to the bottom of this over the weekend. I wish you all a good weekend. There are, as far as I know, there's no homework assignments due. Um, I have not updated the Moodle server. That's a weekend activity once I get the uh, other server working. Um, all that will be outstanding there when it's updated are um, some of those, those lesson review type things, you know, one and two question quizzes about a lesson mostly as a way of taking role. And I probably will create a short quiz on Heck HMS modeling because you've seen me do it uh, most of this week. I'll be 
five or six question. And um, again, when everything's working right, I'll put together a, a homework assignment involving HEC HMS. Until you get the email from me, uh, I don't think you need to worry about any of that. I'm also going to go um, look over the server work and make any um, grade overrides that I have to. Um, when it when it doesn't grade you correctly, I just go ahead and override it. So I'll be doing that. Uh, so Monday, everything I think will be working the way it's supposed to again, and we'll pick up from there. Uh, what we have remaining in the class, I, I don't think we have but more than a, a little less than two weeks to go. Um, we'll complete the routing, and then we're going to look into... Um, putting it all together in a one or two uh, example that uses everything so that you have good exposure to the uh, toolkit. And then a little bit on probability estimation modeling, which in many courses comes earlier in the course. Uh, I elected to save it for later for what at the time was a good reason. And um, I hope uh, that that was not a mistake. And then we'll conclude with a little bit of water quality. I've never used HEC HMS to do water quality modeling, but it, uh, some reading I've done, it seems to have that capability. So this class is not a water quality class per se, but one of the issues in water quality is how quality features move from point A to point B. So I mean, it's totally relevant to hydrograph routing. Think of it as pollutograph routing. So that's all for today. Uh, if there's no questions, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. Um, and I will see you Monday. And have a great weekend. Well, excellent. No questions. Uh, everybody have a good weekend. Bye-bye.